Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. You've been waiting at this station all your life. Waiting to be taken away on a journey of passion and romance to the promised land of romantic connection. You've been waiting for the love train and that mystical soulmate to arrive who will open the door and sweep you off your feet and into the carriage. The door will close and off you will go towards your final destination, the land of bliss, stopping all stations along the way. Well, (laughs) that at least is the myth of romantic love that we've been fed all our lives. It's a universal message that has been pumped out and consumed by the masses of our world. No one is immune to the allure of this messaging and to the promise of ultimate fulfilment that romantic love claims to offer, including myself. The myth of true romantic love and the feelings it brings are like a drug that feeds our desperate human need for true connection. But unfortunately, because this drug is so powerful, love of course can be exploited in our world. Love can be commodified and used by business interests to fuel profits in the marketplace. In this strange world of illusion that we inhabit, the reality is that perhaps the love train is not so much some glorious steam locomotive straight off the set of Harry Potter, but rather a grimy graffiti covered subway train lit up inside by sterile fluorescent lights. Within this carriage, one can feel pressed in, claustrophobic and jolted this way and that jaded at times and yet the drive for romantic love remains maybe the truth about romantic love that we need to focus on is that real love is not so much a feeling as it is an action after all feelings are fickle they come and go and change with the seasons actions on the other hand can be counted on and knitted into the very fabric of our lives indeed real love in practice is probably less flighty than it is domesticated, less inspirational than it is down to earth. Perhaps it is closer to the truth to say that real romantic love is found less in the heights and more in the hard cracked crevices of our daily existence. So what does all this mean? Well, I'm no expert and I'm not really sure. But if you listen close enough to the poem we're featuring today on Lit Poetry, entitled How Do I Love Thee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, perhaps some clarity about love will emerge. Beneath the majestic feelings described in this poem is also a careful description of the plain, everyday acts necessary to successful love. This poem is read to you by the fantastic Dame Judy Dench. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely, as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs, and with my childhood's faith. 
I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a poet of the Victorian era. The Victorian period witnessed profound transformations in British society, economic organisation and culture. It was the era in which Great Britain peaked in its international prominence and influence, as the British Empire extended across much of the known world. The British economy, meanwhile, benefited significantly from the Industrial Revolution, as inventions like the train, the telegraph and the telephone transformed people's abilities to travel and communicate with one another. Barrett Browning's poems were very popular at the time and attracted the attention of Robert Browning, a prominent poet in his own right. He wrote to Elizabeth, writing, I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett. And they secretly married years after their first meeting. During the years of their marriage, Browning and Barrett Browning greatly influenced one another's poetry. In some ways, the Victorian period was an era of great democracy that granted more political power to ordinary people. The 19th century saw the growth of the labour movement, more working class people gaining the right to vote, and higher incomes and standards of living. At the same time, however, industrialisation led to new social ills, like widespread urban poverty and slum living, overcrowding due to the massive growth of the British population and disease epidemics. A similar paradox attended the role of Victorian women like Barrett Browning. Increasingly, women could gain respect and prestige as authors of novels, poetry and prose in their own right. Yet, at the same time, Victorian women were still very constrained in their ability to work and lead independent lives in a society that regarded them as the property of their husbands and fathers. Barrett Browning's increasing interest in women's rights was marked by her reading of feminist thinkers such as Mary Wollstonecraft, her notably egalitarian marriage with Robert Browning and her more liberated life on the European continent, where she socialised with other women authors and spent much of her life in middle age. Elizabeth Barrett Browning made some particularly important relationships with other women writers, in particular her long poem, Aurora Lee in 1896, which tells the semi-autobiographical story of a woman writer, was a source of inspiration for later women poets and activists like Emily Dickinson and Susan B. Anthony. So the first theme I want to talk about here is the theme that deals with romantic love versus spiritual love. In How Do I Love Thee, true love is depicted as long-lasting and even eternal. However, the poem also reveals a tension between love as an attachment to earthly life and the things of this world, and love as something that goes beyond life on earth. By evoking her religious faith so often, the speaker likens her romantic love or her beloved, to a religious or spiritual feeling. At first it seems as if her love for this person on earth might be as powerful as her love for God, but while the speaker acknowledges the strength of her romantic feelings here and now, she also expresses the wish that both she and her lover will eventually transcend their earthly lives and go to heaven together, where their love will be, with God's help, better after death, she writes. Romantic love for her is ultimately closely linked to and perhaps even indistinguishable from love of God. The poem thus argues that true love is eternal, surpassing space, time and even death. Although the poem is often read biographically as an address from the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning to her husband, 
This depiction of eternal and all-powerful love could also apply to any human love, since the speaker and addressee are both unnamed in the poem itself. From the poem's first lines, the speaker describes her love in terms that sound spiritual or religious. For example, she asserts, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. Crucially, it is her soul that is expanding as a result of her love. Love for her engages the soul as well as the body. She also explains that her love helps her feel the ends of being an ideal grace. The ends here connotes the goals of existence, which for the speaker is the attainment of ideal grace. The speaker is clearly evoking the religious meaning of grace as a gift from God. If her love gives her grace, then she means that it is bringing her closer to God. The speaker also writes that she loves her beloved with her childhood's faith and with a love she seems to lose with her lost saints. Her childhood's faith and her lost saints presumably refer to the Christianity in which she was raised. The speaker's description of her lost saints suggests that perhaps she has experienced a loss of faith as an adult, but this new romantic love restores her faith in God and gives her back the love she had seemed to lose. In the end, the speaker's romantic love does not diminish her love for God. Rather, she likens her romantic love to a religious experience that helps her replicate her childhood's faith in order to bring her closer to the ideal grace of God. She prays that God's salvation in heaven will perfect her earthly love, making it better after death, and render it eternal. In this way, the poem argues that romantic love is closely related to, and indeed perhaps transforms into, love for God. The second theme I want to talk about here deals with love versus reason. In what is possibly one of the most celebrated lines of a poem in English literature, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways, the speaker begins listing the ways in which she loves her beloved. The poem therefore commences as a way of trying to justify love in rational terms. By conveying her desire to count the ways, the speaker argues that her love can be supported on an intellectual level. However, she also claims that love is actually something more profound, spiritual and full of destiny. In this way, her opening attempt to count the ways in which she loves slowly surrenders to an understanding that love is often not a rational feeling and can't be explained. The speaker sets out to count the ways in which she loves and this organisational structure shapes the form of the rest of the poem. Throughout the poem, the speaker refers to seven ways in which she loves her partner. This might at first look like a counterintuitive or overly argumentative format for a love poem. Nevertheless, she implies that her love for her partner is reasoned and logical because it is based on the everyday, mundane actions of life. I love you, she writes, to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. This love isn't of mythic proportions or full of grandeur. Rather, it exists in the mutual bonds of everyday tenderness and exchange. The speaker also explains that she loves her beloved purely as men turn from praise, implying that her love isn't based on pride or embellishment. By being based on these more humble virtues of fidelity and self-sacrifice, she implies that love can be appraised simply by the degree of care one gives to the other person. And yet, even as the speaker says that her love can be counted, she frequently uses language that implies her love is something beyond restraint, something that's all-encompassing and resistant to measurements. 
For instance, she declares, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, which sounds rather infinite. The idea of infinity lingers until the end of the poem, when the speaker conveys her desire that she and her beloved will love after death in the afterlife, which is to say, infinitely, because in Christian theology, salvation leads to eternal life in heaven. In this way, the poem first imagines love as something rational or measurable, but ends up by asserting that love sometimes can't be explained by reason or measured, no matter how hard one might try to do so. As the love train leaves the station, we say goodbye to this really famous sonnet and look forward to next week's episode. The poem for next week will be The Windhover by Jared Manley Hopkins. In the end, some of us may not be lucky in love, but we can always be lucky in the richness that poetry brings. I really hope that you like the poem that we featured on Lit Poetry this week. To support our work, we'd love it if you would consider subscribing to our podcast or YouTube channel. We'll finish by listening one more time to the poem. I'll see you next time. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.